one of the greatest sailors in U.S. Navy history is unknown to most Americans, and he's probably unknown to a lot of sailors today. By contrast, this individual is known by every man, woman, and child in Japan. Commodore Matthew Calbraith Perry had an exceptional Navy career, the pinnacle of which was opening Japan to the West, an action that changed the course of world history. Perry was born in Rhode Island in 1794, the son of Captain Christopher R. Perry, who served in the Continental Navy during the Revolutionary War and later in the U.S. Navy. He grew up in Newport, Rhode Island at 31 Walnut Street, not even a thousand yards from where I was born. The house still stands today. In 1809, at the age of 14, Perry was appointed a midshipman. In the coming years, he would serve under some of the greatest leaders of the early U.S. Navy. His first assignment was aboard USS Revenge, commanded by his brother, Lieutenant Oliver Hazard Perry, who would go on to win fame as the hero of the Battle of Lake Erie in 1813. Matthew Perry would go on to serve in two of the original six frigates of the U.S. Navy before and during the War of 1812. He was next assigned to USS President under Commodore John Rogers, and during an engagement which the ship fought, Perry was wounded in action. Next. Perry served aboard USS United States, commanded by Commodore Stephen Decatur. In these early years, Perry proved himself, and he was promoted to lieutenant in 1813. Later, Perry was assigned to be the executive officer, the number two officer, of USS Cyan. In 1820, at the order of President James Monroe, Cyan escorted the ship Elizabeth, which carried 88 freed African Americans to the west coast of Africa to establish what would become the nation of Liberia. In subsequent years, Perry would make cruises to thwart piracy in the Caribbean and Mediterranean, as well as patrols to interdict the slave trade. In 1826, Perry was promoted to Master Commandant, a rank that later was changed to Commander. Eleven years later, in 1837, Perry was promoted to Captain, and he was given command of USS Fulton, the first steam-powered warship in the U.S. Navy. Perry became an active proponent for modernizing the fleet, and he became known as the father of the steam navy. He was a driving force for professional education among Navy officers. He co-founded and wrote for the Naval Magazine, a professional journal of the sea services, forerunner of the U.S. Naval Institute's proceedings. Also, he was appointed member of a board that prepared the first course of instruction for the U.S. Naval Academy. In 1843, Perry was made Commodore of the Africa Squadron and led it on further anti-slave patrols. During the Mexican War, Perry was appointed Commodore of the U.S. Home Squadron, and on June 16, 1847, Perry personally led a force of 1,173 Marines and sailors ashore in the successful attack and capture of a Mexican fort at the Second Battle of Tabasco. Since 1600, Japan had been run by the Tokugawa Shogun, a generalissimo, even though there was still an emperor. After taking control, the Shogun went on to expel foreigners and close Japan to the outside world. 250 years later, in the mid-19th century, there was increasing Western trade with China. European nations were securing coaling stations in Asia exclusively for themselves, and American whalers were hunting in the waters off Japan. If whalers or other ships had the misfortune to run aground in Japan, sailors were imprisoned or even killed for violating Japan's laws forbidding foreigners. In 1852, Perry was assigned a mission by President Millard Fillmore to open Japan's ports to American interaction. He was to deliver a letter from President Fillmore to the Japanese emperor asking for decent treatment and return of shipwrecked sailors opening ports in Japan to take on coal, provisions, and water, and, ultimately, trade. If Google had existed in the 1850s, and you were to do a search for who would be the best diplomat to deal with a closed nation, the number one return would be Matthew Calbraith Perry. Throughout his career, he'd had numerous diplomatic interactions. Perry had negotiations and discussions with the top admiral of the Turkish Navy, who was the number three in the Ottoman Empire, the Kingdom of Naples, President of Liberia, numerous African chiefs, tribal leaders in Mexico, and a British Royal Navy Admiral to discuss treaty issues. When Tsar Nicholas I of Russia met Perry, he was so impressed that he offered to make him an Admiral in the Russian Navy. Perry was given carte blanche by the President and the State Department to negotiate the best possible deal he could get. 
and he planned his expedition meticulously. He found every book in existence on Japan. He got the latest charts from captains who'd been near Japanese islands. He secured illustrators and translators. He gathered gifts for the Japanese, more on that later, and obtained the best sailors he could get, including captains with whom he'd served in the Mexican War. Among the eight ships that went with him to Japan on the first visit, three of them, USS Mississippi, his flagship, USS Poetan, and USS Susquehanna, were steam frigates whose sails were augmented by twin side-mounted paddle wheels. Perry set off for Japan in 1852, making several stops en route, including Okinawa, which they called Luchu because they had a hard time saying Ryukyu, and concluded a tree to resupply and take on coal there. Sending a couple hundred marines and sailors ashore probably didn't hurt the negotiation process. Perry reached Japan in July of 1853. When the Japanese saw the American ships entering Tokyo Bay belching smoke and moving somehow without sail power, they panicked at the sight of these kurofune, black ships, and called in military reinforcements to repel the foreigners. Boats filled with soldiers surrounded the American ships, telling them in no uncertain terms to go home. Perry refused to budge. Ultimately, Japanese negotiators came aboard the U.S. ships, and Perry explained through interpreters that he was there to deliver the president's letter to the emperor. Ultimately, the Japanese decided to receive the letter, and they made negotiations on where Perry could land to deliver it. The Japanese tried to push for Nagasaki. That was the one port where, once a year, a Dutch ship and some Chinese ships could do some trade with Japan. Perry refused. Eventually, they settled on Kurihama, a small town south of Yokohama. Boats were landed with marines and sailors and bands to make for a formal ceremony for Perry's coming ashore. Hasty arrangements were made to have two noblemen receive the letter, which they did in a formal ceremony on July 14th. The president's letter was passed to Lord Abe Masahiro, who was a sort of prime minister for Shogun Tokugawa Iesara. Kurihama is now part of Greater Yokohama, and this is the beach where Perry landed when I visited in 2004. There's a small museum there and a monument to honor Commodore Perry's landing. These seashells came from the beach at Kurihama. Commodore Perry himself was a seashell collector, and he was actually given a large quantity of them from the Japanese government. With President Fillmore's letter up the Japanese chain of command, Perry left, telling the Japanese that he would be back in a year to get the answer. Much sooner than that, in February 1854, Perry and a larger force of ships returned. Negotiations went back and forth on where to hold the discussions. The Japanese once again recommended Nagasaki. Perry said no to that. And eventually they settled on Yokohama, which then was a tiny village. Perry knew that he would have some difficult negotiations ahead. For this, he drew on his previous diplomatic activities to try to present himself with the greatest advantage. Perry wrote, this experience has admonished me that, with people of forms, it is necessary either to set all ceremony aside or to out Herod Herod in assumed personal consequences and ostentation. Perry chose to out Herod Herod. On March 8th, 500 sailors and marines were sent ashore in 27 of the ship's boats. Three bands were also sent ashore. The marines and sailors were drawn up in a huge cordon facing inboard. Perry, reaching the beach, steps ashore. Behind him are two of the largest African-American sailors in his squadron, one carrying the national flag, one carrying Perry's personal pennant. As Perry's foot touched the beach, the troops were brought to present arms, and the bands struck up the star-spangled banner. You know what you call that? An entrance. In Perry's absence, the Tokugawa shogunate had pretty much decided to agree to just about all of the requests in President Fillmore's letter. Still, there were details to iron out. As far as the ports where American ships could take on coal, water, and food, the Japanese once again brought up Nagasaki, at which point Perry had pretty much had enough and said, would you please shut the hell up about Nagasaki? So eventually, they decided on two cities, Shibota, 50 miles southwest of Tokyo, 
and Hakodate on the northern island of Hokkaido. The Japanese agreed to stop the mistreatment of shipwrecked sailors, but they drew the line at trade with the Americans and refused to have that as part of the treaty. Perry, realizing that two out of three conditions wasn't bad, agreed. Because neither the Japanese nor the Americans had strong translators in the other's language, but both knew people who could speak Dutch and Chinese, the forthcoming treaty was actually written up in four different languages, Dutch, Chinese, Japanese, and English. This would ensure that the terms for both sides were unambiguous. As the negotiations were progressing, both sides warmed to each other. Gifts were exchanged on both sides. Now, Perry had chosen many of the gifts that he brought with them to sort of make the point that if you open to trade with us, look at all the wonderful things you can get. Among these were modern rifles and muskets and revolvers, which Samuel Colt donated for the effort, two complete telegraph sets, the operation of which several sailors were trained personally by Samuel Morse, a barrel of whiskey, Madeira, a selection of books, but perhaps the most significant gift was a one-quarter scale functional railroad set with engine and track. I can't imagine a more interesting sight than seeing hardened samurai warriors riding on top of this train at 20 miles an hour, gleefully circling the track. Additionally, each side threw a huge banquet for the other. The Americans held theirs aboard USS Poetan. There was a lot of food and there was a lot of alcohol, which the Japanese enjoyed in great quantity. Eventually, one of the Japanese, who were fastidious on their etiquette and manners, actually came up to Perry and threw his arm around his neck. Through an interpreter, he said, Japan, America, all same heart. One of Perry's officers was surprised by this and went to the Commodore and asked why he let him do that. Perry replied, oh, if they just sign the treaty, he may kiss me. On March 31st, 1854, a treaty of peace and amity, friendship, was signed between the United States and Japan. Because the village of Yokohama was located in Kanagawa Prefecture, the treaty became known as the Treaty of Kanagawa. In 2004, I had the great privilege to be able to see the original copies that Perry brought back with him in the vaults of the National Archives. Perry returned to the United States and was ordered to Washington to prepare a publication called Narrative of the Expedition of an American Squadron to the China Seas and Japan. He completed the work at the very end of 1857, but sadly three months later he died of rheumatic fever. Originally he was buried in New York City, but in 1866 he was reinterred in Island Cemetery in Newport, Rhode Island, 500 yards from the house where he grew up and 200 yards from his older brother, Oliver Hazard Perry. This is me visiting Perry's tomb in 2009. Perry's legacy has continued in many ways. In September 1945, the ensign that flew above his flagship USS Mississippi was sent out to the battleship USS Missouri, and it was mounted on the bulkhead overlooking the formal surrender ceremony in Tokyo Bay ending World War II in the Pacific. There are monuments and statues to Perry in Kurihama, Hakodate, Shimoda, and at Naha, Okinawa. There was even a gargantuan snow sculpture of him done for a winter festival in Hokkaido. But my favorite is in his hometown of Newport, Rhode Island in Turo Park. Beneath the statue of the Commodore is a bronze sculpture encircling the base. Scenes recall Perry's many contributions to the Navy and the nation in nearly 50 years of service in combating the slave trade as a fighter and as a leader, and perhaps most significant, as a diplomat who changed the course of world events. Check back soon for more content. Thanks for watching.